Okay. All right, uh, everyone, welcome to Six Scale. Um, please add your name to the attendee list. Uh, the link to the, the, to the document is in chat. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, some um, some test framework ideas. So we've um, we've we've had a few um, um, we've had some progress uh, on a few things. So uh, I have this little tracking area right here where I just kind of like added things that we're working on issues just so we can have an idea. So we had um, one issue, or one PR that was merged. Uh, so David Vossel did some good work on adding the um, the VMI phase transition times, which, which merged. Um, so that's awesome. So now we can uh, start looking to, you know, consuming this data and, and even look at um, different ways that we can pull this into uh, CI and start, and start measuring. So that's what I wanted to to talk about today, um, and and we can talk about this from uh, two perspectives: um, performance and from scaling. Um, so I figured we'd start with performance. So there's um, there's already some work um, that's that's begun around this. Um, I think Marcelo's here. Um, there, uh, Marcelo wrote a um, IPR uh, looking to consume some. Um, to kind of build a, a job around um, performance testing so that we can measure against PR uh, in each PR. Um, so there's a bunch of things that uh, are in this PR. And so um, I told them I, I went and created a, um, an issue around this topic for performance test framework that covers a bunch of things. But um, so before we get into that though, um, I kind of want to back up even a little bit more and talk about this idea in general and get some thoughts and then and then I can always update um, that issue afterwards. So take some notes. So um, at a high level, um, like the goal we want to accomplish is that we want to have in every PR that's run, we want to have um, a way to measure with their, if we're above some sort of performance threshold um, with this PR, um, or if we increase performance or decrease performance, whatever it is, we want to be able to measure it. Um, and we want to have this, uh, some tool to measure it. Uh, we want to run it in every against every PR, and we also want to have developers run it against their local um, code. So we want it consumable by by those two different personas. Um, so um, with that in mind, um, you know what what are people's thoughts on like how we can do this? Um, I just wrote a few points here, but I think this can be expanded quite a bit. Um, what are what do folks think? Well, I think this takes uh, very well uh, the overview of the PR that I and then the document that I sent last time um, in the main list. And the idea is, is exactly that. So to be able to track the performance regression or improvement for PRs and also for release. Um, the, also the idea is to have like three types of uh, size of tests some uh, what I'm saying is small scale that we can run for each PR. It's, for, for each PR, it cannot be it's too big, isn't it? Otherwise, it would be too slow to, to, to get a PR you know, merged and tested. But the idea is to have then the medi uh, medians. Um, yeah, exactly. So some median tests that we can run like daily, and then we can just you know get some uh, idea you know daily what's happening also for the prs and uh, but with a, a larger uh, set of uh, tests and then a large scale test um, that I actually i don't know if we can run so big right now but i would say like maybe you know uh, well, ideally, is to have like something very big, um, and then if we run for each release. I don't know what's what's big in the biggest thing that we can reach right now, but one thousand looks good now. But we can maybe go even further if it's needed. Um, and then just large scale tests. The idea is to run for each uh, release uh, before each release or for each release, something like that, and. And then we can track that. I've been discussing with the Red Hat folks about that for a while. 
uh, we are getting access to some resource to run it for the upstream. So I actually got access to some uh, small tests uh, that we can uh, start to include for the PRs now, uh, performance tests. I also want, want to make, you know, to, there are a couple of things here for performance and the way that I'm going to configure the, this, the, the, the infrastructure. So first of all, the performance tests must not have collocation. So we need to be very carefully when we are running the tests. Another thing is right now, the way that uh, the functional tests are running, they run with a lot of nested virtualization things. For example, it's, it's well, not a lot, but what's happening is it, the Kubevert CI, uh, that's the way that it's deployed uh, um, the Kubernetes cluster. It's run inside of VM and then it creates VMs inside VM. So um, we don't want to use the Kubevert CI uh, in that way. We want to have the Kubernetes cluster running directly on the bare metal node. I mean, it's just to avoid any analysis for nested virtualizations, especially because we had the experience that Kubevirt doesn't run very well um, on nested virtualization, at least some tests that uh, we have done in IBM about that, but it's just, this is not a topic. Is just for sort of interrupting, is this about actually booting the VMs in there? Sorry? Is this about booting the VMs? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I would expect that uh, for an initial phase, we should really not boot VMs fully. Mm -hmm. So what about, well, if we don't, um, so if we don't boot VMs, so, we, so that means that we, um, the running phase, uh, when we reach running um, the VM in a transition time, that means that, that what, like that's when we've handed off to the handler, but doesn't necessarily mean we have to boot. We just kind of stop at some at some point. It means that the QMU process. Well, it means and when it reaches running. Yeah, it means that uh, that we got the report from Libvirt that QEMU started the booting process. I think so what Roman really the was getting at is that we're not measuring, we're just measuring the control plane. So maybe said differently, uh, initially we're just measuring the control plane's ability to scale. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, so we could say, uh, so I think, so that's important. And I think um, I, the way I view this is kind of like stressing the control plane I view is more like the scale side of this, which I do want to talk about. Um, but like for pure performance testing, though, we, do we want to boot the VMs? Would that make sense? That sounds like we would. We have some. I, I had actually some discussion on that with Roman. Um, well, I, I think both scenarios are, are interesting. So right now we decide to go to not boot the VMs and try to put as much as possible pressure to the control plane. Booting the VMs can bring some benefits, like it. We can make sure that, for example, the network it's operational, everything it's working, everything you know gets exactly uh, allocated to the VM that should be. If we don't boot that, we, some some of these things we cannot check. Um, but it's fine for now because what I'm saying, the plan now is to put pressure as much as possible to the control plane. And just to answer that, in the PR that I implemented was running. Um, means the VM got the state running. And it just means that the you know start the start command was sent to the kubevirt uh, sorry, sorry the libvirt and but doesn't mean that the VM will actually put so okay I think I understand. So does um does this have does this require extra work that like we like we prevent the VM from booting? Or it's not the easy to do. It may, mostly just means that you give it uh, just a little bit of RAM. This means that QMU comes up, the BIOS, in, CBIOS initializes and then kernel immediately crashes because it runs out of memory and then it's stuck. Yeah. Okay. It's like very few CPU and memory and then it doesn't boot, so. What if we yeah. use one of those kernel um, images, like just a really, really, really bare bones, then it, it wouldn't have to necessarily crash and booting would be 
practically non-existent. I mean, it would boot, but it wouldn't do anything really. It would just exist. I'm not sure. Whatever needs less memory and CPU, I would say. Yeah, well, I guess I'm just worried <clears throat> about the, the crash case because we would kind of want to know if the crash is our control plane doing something crazy like Vert Launcher, like- Oh, uh, but uh, in this case, Vert Launcher stays running if that is your concern. Oh. Yeah, oh, okay, we have so no stays... idea if the VM inside is booting or not. We just see QEMO is running and happy. But that doesn't we, mean- We wouldn't so get the traffic. We wouldn't get traffic from things like guest agents updates and the um, all the updates to the status as the as the OS comes up and goes later halts. Uh, yeah, which sure, we've sure. seen, yeah. But from a Kubernetes perspective, you don't need the guest agent or anything. So really, just sure. that the QMO process is alive is means the VM is running. And I mean, it really means that. But in this so case. You said progress. the word crash uh, earlier, so I might have missed. Yeah, the kernel crashes. I but see. if the kernel crashes, that does not mean that the emulated computer is crashing. It's like oh. if you boot Windows and you get a blue screen. Got it. Yeah, as long as the commute, whatever it takes to get the commute process up and keep it up. Uh, yeah, as long, that's yeah. exactly what this Totally is. in agreement there. All right. That sounds like a really lightweight way we could just get a lot of VMs going okay so then i i guess so what i'll way i'll characterize this and you know correct me if you'll disagree so i would say like we start with vms that won't boot um there are other areas we can look at here um if we do want to expand this because this does limit the scope in that like we like you said um we can't do any stuff with um with the running like if we wanted to do like attached devices we wanted to attach a network we wanted to do like time to ip address or something like that we can't do that and now that could be something we could consider doing measuring in the future if we wanted to. So that could be an extension, but maybe this is like the first step that we can look at the mm -hmm. most, most um, achievable goal in front of us. So we, so we could do um, yeah, I would say it's the least controversial in general because you don't have to care about the operating system at all and some considerations there. Which, like for instance, what happens with your data if you up, have to at some point update zeros if you're using it or Fedora version or whatever. Right? So it's a very reliable source to not boot the VM. That's what I would say. Everything else depends a lot on a lot of other factors. Okay. Um, okay. So it sounds like with this idea, so we could reach a lot of a lot of VMs. Is there like um? I, yeah, I guess we wouldn't really know what the limit is. So it will eventually just reach something where we'll be able to like, oh, actually, let me phrase this differently. So like um, these VMs, they're not bootable. Um, we're going to do it in Nest Invert. Um, and what's like, um, I don't know, what, what would be like roughly um, the number of VMs like we could do? Like what's the most that we've been able to see? Do you have any ideas? Well, so if we give like a, we can do some math i would say like how many how many resources we can allocate if we can we are going to get like one zero point one from uh one cpu then we can have like uh you know 10 vms per cpu something like that okay. or maybe we can have also um you know over provisioning of CPU, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. All right, I'll just say there's another question then. Okay. Um, okay, that sounds pretty reasonable. We can sounds like something we can start with. Okay, so we, so we don't boot these VMs. Um, uh, things we want to do, like we want to capture the metric support um, PR performance center. So this would be like, so David's change. We have, we have all the phases. We should capture all of them, um, and then we have some sort of report. Um, and we need to, we need also need to find this like meets performance standards. Um, yeah, I think this is something which we will just find out. So mm -hmm. I would expect that we start like with, uh, running the tests three times, like with okay. 20 VMs, 50 VMs and 100 VMs on the same Kubernetes configuration, the same cluster. And, uh, and initially it's just the matter of comparing them 
and seeing like, and then you can start defining like, uh, what baseline do we reach with these bulks and where is the startup time moving? And this is the base data. And once we have, once we have it and visualize it or can compare it, we can start defining baselines. That's what I would say. Everything okay. else is, would be a little bit just arbitrary, I'd say. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then do we want to talk about, um, so that so this would be our first step. So we even want to talk about this other stuff, like defining the types of tests then. So we get a, ba we get a baseline metric um, and we, I think we answer this question too. We figure out like how many VMs. Um, so I'm going to move this down here. Yeah. I would so even get these... leave a question like VM density. I would even not try to answer that right now. Okay. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of yeah because I think there's like a we could talk there's lots of types of tests we can do so yeah so okay so first step will be um, so I like the idea of let's let's do some information gathering here let's figure out um, let's figure out the answer to this um, let's attempt to test let's define standards and let's figure out how many VMs we can reasonably do this with and uh, um, I think the numbers above I don't know what we can run right now. Uh, yeah, Marcelo, uh, you know how many machines you got, uh, or, or how, how much you can scale from that perspective. But I, w I think it's even very reasonable to not even start with two big numbers, numbers, and we would still get reasonable input, like really 20, 50, 100, maybe 200. It's, it's not like uh, <laughs> NVIDIA that ha got like 200. You, you guys have a cluster of 200, isn't it? So it, it will be a much smaller cluster with. Um, I just meant, meant the bulk of VMs which you start, not the number of nodes. <laughs> okay, yeah, I know, yeah. I'm just saying uh, for the amount of VMs that I'm thinking, it's to start with 100. You know, it's for the the, the small scale uh, PR that we are we are thinking about. And of course, we can push to see how much we can get with the cluster that we, we got, but it shouldn't be too big now. Um, I mean, up to you what you want to start with, but it would, I would recommend even smaller sizes like 20, 50, 100 is the start or 10, 50, 100, whatever, mm -hmm. just to get okay. it to, so that we can get uh, initially initially an insight into where the things are moving when more VMs are getting in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it, it's it's a good good thing to do this scaling from this. Like, still, yeah. Yeah. So scaling okay. still with smaller numbers so that we can do it faster. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Marcel, um, I'm going to assign this to you since you've already been looking at this. So this will be, we want to, we want to try to answer these two questions. We want to know the performance baseline and how many VMs that we can get mm -hmm. to. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So then, um, so we can, so that'll be like uh, what we can, what we can start with. Um, so there's the other thing, the other aspect of this, um, we, we, let's take some time. We can even talk about like different ways that we can um, expand this, maybe some different types of tests. Um, so like I wrote, which one is it? This, uh, this issue after I saw um, Marcel's PR. So the, um, I tried to define a few things in here. Um, so the few things like, like this, like what are the different types of ways we can generate load, different types of ways that things, tests we can do. Um, so you talked about density, you know, burst testing. That's that's one. We could do stress testing, um, uh, soak, spike testing. Um, these are just some of the ones I've I've read about. Um, does that make sense to people? Like, what's like? What do you think? Is there could there be more here? Um, what do folks think of these? Yeah. So I don't know if it's covered here, uh, but one of the tests that I, actually so. And the plan that I sent for, I was thinking about three different kind of tests. One is, you know, this of a uh, shock test that we create a bunch of VMs. That can, it's the density test, or we can we can do like different ways stress, as you mentioned here. And another one, it should be like uh, you know to measure the steady state of the a constant load that we generate. So especially to to measure, you know, the scheduling, uh, we we can configure for, for example, ten VMs per second, and we should define a maximum, you know, uh, population in the in the cluster, 
and delete the VMs and keep the load constant for a, for a you know constant period and see how the system uh, maybe it's the stress test here that we wrote in it. So how the system keeps with the constant load, uh, it might break the system. So and uh, especially if the, the, the pressure is very high. And another thing is, I don't know if we want to cover that, but it's, I'm just thinking about this test. Uh, Kubernetes is also doing them. So that's why I'm trying to include here also, these three different tests that I mentioned. Uh, the other one is like chaos test. So we just suddenly remove a node and things should come back, you know, and we need to measure how long does it take to the system recover. Yeah, do we, well, I don't know if we want to do that here though. Like I, I understand that need for that. Definitely like we could kill some of the control plane or something and see what happens. But I don't know, I mean, doing that while we're measuring performance, I don't know if it's going to get us a lot of um, data that like that, like it, the, we could get a lot of variation in the data just based on things, just all the things happening in the cluster. Yeah, so I think we wanted to- testing, I, I wouldn't couple that with this necessarily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, well, the other thing, so um, I, I was just thinking of this. So I, I have another thing here. We have we have generate types of load. Um, this is another question. Um, how are we going to generate load? Um, I, I just lumped it in here as part of this tool, but it's an open question. I know David, you've talked about this like previously. Um, like what do people think? Like how can we generate load? Is that, that's another thing we need to figure out. I think everything's on the table there. Uh, I think that the, um... CI or the functional tests um, that we're generating load uh, that Marcelo is already starting on, that, that makes sense. It's not very configurable necessarily, but I think as a standard way of just repeating the same test over and over again, yeah, that, that's probably fine. Uh, there's some other tools I looked at like KubeBurner, uh, which it needs a little, like I need to submit a little patch just to make it wait on virtual machines to, until they're ready. But it allows you to create a repeatable config. So you would define a config um, with some VM templates kind of, and it would um, start having ever many iterations of that exact same virtual machine you want. Wait until they all come online, then go to the next iteration, start like, you know, a hundred more. And like, you can represent things like that. And even like the deletion of them afterwards. So you can, in one config, define how you want to um, kind of stepwise um, add load. Um, so we could use a tool like that. And I'm sure there's others as well. Do we, um, I guess so we can um, maybe leave this to some investigation. So I, well, okay, what would be the easiest to get started? Uh, Marcelo seems to be like, you've already have something. So maybe we can just start with that to see just see like how it goes. Like if it, it, we could just start with it and then, you know, as we maybe start to look at expanding it because we have other use cases, we can look at QBurner or other use cases as something that we need to be more configurable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just just to, to give like very, very high level background why I start to, to write it in a, as a functional test. Um, because first of all, we want to add you know, um, in the Kubernetes CI, the, the the jobs run it, so that the the load generator should be well, it not not necessarily should be in Kubernetes uh, repository, but uh, that's why we just, I discussed with Raman and he suggested to to keep there, and it was I I I thought it was more natural to add it. Uh, as the functional test, as everything was in this uh, folder, you know, uh, Kubernetes test, and and also it can be, you know, used like that. Um, and I've, uh, I I received some comments in the PR. Um, I think it was uh, David. I don't remember now. So um, yeah, that was me. Yeah. So he suggested to actually um, separate the part that I'm collecting the metrics and make it like a, a framework. So as Ryan suggested, also, you know, to have this uh, performance framework and actually create like a tool that it, I, I saw this Kubeburn, 
Could burn is doing something very similar, isn't it? Um, but the tool can be something more or less what could burn is doing for collecting the result. And then anything can generate the load, like uh, we were discussing um, the, the, the functional task or any scripts or even could burn just, just generating the load. But I think it's would be a help like to, to keep the track now to have like this, uh, you know, um, functional test to create the VMs, and then we can just test, verify some uh, thresholds, and actually the test will fail. So th this kind of structure that helps, you know, to have the PR, the, perf the performance test in the Kubevert CI. So that's why it's good also to have it in the uh, as a functional test. Well, is there a way to get the numbers without like? Because I, I I do like the um because to me, like I said on the comment, like we. One of the goals, we, we want to have a framework. We want it to be so that it can be usable in CI or by users. And so I, like, that's why, why I suggested that is we could, we could discuss that specifically in, a, um, in, a, uh, in its own PR and then, and then have like, so that we can kind of separate the idea of generating load out because it, because it can be anything you know, like we said here. Uh, but but if, is there a way like you can, um, we could take what you have and we can generate that base, like answer these questions. Yes. Um, like so, without, without merging it, like, so we can just get the data and then we can look at the, the different components of it and yes. comment on them. Mm -hmm. We can do that. Okay. So without merging. So I actually, the, you know, the, the functional test that I created, I don't know if it's the best practice to that, but anyway, I'm actually reading a configuration file and in the configuration file, it's possible to define the number of VMs and the functional test will actually be dynamically configured. So, and you know, it's not hard to code at that. The, the, the test configuration itself is not hard to code. It. It's in the configuration of YAML. So, I, okay. So why don't we do this? So here's, yeah, go ahead, Rowan. Uh, I just want to say, would it be an option for you to just split out a very basic functional test, which can be, which runs with two or three different bulk sizes, like a table test or something without much configuration options, really just using zeros, almost no memory and so on, like we discussed, and so that we can bring that in and just run it on a broader map and that we can, so that we can basically discuss your PR, which adds already a lot separately. You mean simplify the, the dense test, isn't it? Yeah, mostly about, I mean, we, we kind of, I think we kind of agreed now to one first basic kind of test, which is really just putting a very, uh, a, small, as, as a very, very small VM, as small as possible, and creating it in bulk and collecting the metrics for it. And I guess just a simple end-to-end -end test would yeah. be sufficient for that without any framework or anything. We collect the Prometheus metrics. We can we can collect the Prometheus metrics for that already and collect the baseline data. And we could then discuss the rest of the PR without pressure. So mm -hmm. you mean just the like just the test itself with we would collect externally of the test suite the data? I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, I mean okay. we prepared everything in, in Hubert in the CI environment so that uh, the data would be collected from. Uh, so the, the, the PR is doing that right now. Um, I don't know. Well, so, uh, hold on. Yeah, it's so just, it's take, just big, that's all, I mean. <laughs> what are we talking about um, as far as the data collection? Are we talking about manually collecting it ourselves or are we talking about the data collection that is currently in the PR? I just want to make sure. Uh, it, it's, uh, yeah. There is in the CI environment, there is now, there are rules in place which instruct the Prometheus and Thanos instance there to collect the metrics from all the instances which run the tests. Sure. I'm saying when we talk about, so right now the PR is creating a report of some sort, or that's what we're talking about there. I'm not sure how much has been implemented there. We're talking about just the density tests and we would be looking at the results ourselves. So not having the functional test actually prepare a report for us. Is that accurate? Or are you wanting the functional test to prepare a report as well, Roman? 
I did not think about the report right now, but maybe you think it's incorrect. Well, I, I, I guess I would be in favor of getting a density test as optional, uh, a really small density test, just the bare minimum that we need to begin to start thinking about this stuff and immediately, and let that be the thing that kind of starts um, the ball moving here. And then for us to work on metrics collecting and things like that and generating a report independently of that. Uh, I, I do agree that I think we're lumping a lot of stuff into that one PR and it's going to be difficult to get merged because it is so large and there's yeah. enough contention on exactly one. how to proceed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, th I think I got it. Uh, I can, you know, simplify and remove the configuration and the report yeah. part from the PR and it will be yeah, like really just this fast and easily scenario. for me to do that. Clear and easy without many configuration options, which for sure will come in the future. But mm -hmm. yeah. so, I think by the way, so in, just one, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so in the PR, I, I'm collecting like uh, different things. Okay, so first is the VM creation time. And another thing is the resource usage for, for the memory and CPU. And things, for example, that I'm analyzing, um, I give like uh, the, for the VM. Each VM in each VMI 0 0.1 CPU uh, request, okay, and limit. And then I get like the resource usage of the pod that it's, of course, many containers run inside. And in my very simple test that I did, it was using the double of the CPU that should, it was allocated for the VMI. So something else, uh, virt handler, and maybe something else that it's there in the pod it's consuming, uh, you know, some overhead of CPU. And this kind of things that I thought was important, that's why I'm collecting this. And, and then uh, do I still co uh, collect that to test? Or do you guys think that this PR should have only the latency and not the resource? I think that the PR should just have the density test and not the anything with metrics collecting. Yeah, I agree to that. And I think that when we look at the metrics collecting part, like if we look at an external tool or whatever, like I mentioned maybe in the tools uh, directory, we'd start with just a single, something really, really simple. Like just the very, maybe we just start with transition times to begin with and create a report that just shows that. And then we keep expanding that and introduce uh, memory and CPU uh, perhaps, or, or other things we're interested. I'm just saying, let's start small uh, and add on uh, as we start getting more data in. Okay. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Yeah, the, the purpose is really just to avoid that this PR just sticks there forever. Uh -huh. And today's everything, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, I'd, I'd add to that number of API calls made um, the VMI or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. I, there's like a bunch of them. Um, so, yeah, I covered this, um, Gavin, in like the um, like I have I have listed three here, and it, like the one of comments like I mentioned is that basically everything that in this PR could be a threshold test, every single thing here. So yeah, like uh, but um, but like 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 we're saying, like these are, we'll we'll get there. So I'd like the I like the idea with starting. Um, let's start with uh, that simple desk density test, and then we have all of this that we can expand to. So that it's good. So for I think for the you know, in the Kubernetes CI, we don't have we don't need to have like too many thresholds um, metrics, but it's just some key ones. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys saw, I, I started some time ago to do like a, just a document for, you know, defining just um, what should be our uh, SLOs for the Kubevert. So, you know, for example, VM creation time, it's one of the metrics that we should pay attention. And I don't think we should have dozen of them it's too much things, you know, and, and get complicated to, to analyze and see, even though some of yeah. them represent the same thing, so. Um, uh, I would really suggest to just start with the transition times, which are pretty clear that they're important. Yeah. And then we can look at where to expand. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, Marcelo, we have, so I'd say, Marcelo, these are the three things um, that, that I have for action items that you can take here. So like we do that, so we look for the baseline, we're gonna figure out how many VMs we can handle in the CI. And then we take your PR and we, we break it down to a simple density test. And then we, we then come back and we look at separating this out um, into a framework, which could then include all of these things. Mm -hmm. So that'll be part of the discussion. Just okay. one last question about uh, the framework. So should the framework should be like a different repository, like Kubern is doing, something like that, or something can, inside Kubern? So we can talk about think? it when we get there. I think like the, I think when, um, I think that's something, that, that'll probably be a good, discuss, good discussion topic, uh, maybe for next meeting. If we talk, mm -hmm. after we get this data, I think that's something, Maybe after like a two weeks go by, we get we get that information and then we start seeing, okay, here's how we can expand on this. Then I think it will be a little clearer um, what we should do. So we can take that for a next time for next time. I'll leave it as a question here. We have a directory for just kind of one-off tools. So we can start. If it's just for convenience, we are in a build system and everything uh, in Qvert. We can start in the Qvert repo and just as the path of least resistance. And if we want to uh, separate that out of the Qvert repo later on, I don't, I don't see that being a problem. Yeah. Okay. I think the, this sounds pretty good. I think we have a plan to go with this performance test framework um, and the density tests and get things kicked off. Um, so that makes sense to me. Okay. So I, I'll, um, I'll do like some of the tracking here as best I can. I just kind of use issues and tag things. Um, but if I call oh, issue, this was another thing. If we, um, Marcelo, I saw you, you labeled this six scale. Do we, do we, is there like a label we can add for like um, scale? Does that make sense to people? Uh, I can, yeah, I can talk with, with the, well, actually Roma is one of the guys. In, <laughs> so the CI guy, so maybe, I think it makes sense to add that. Yeah, I was thinking we could have some labels and then I can just filter for like what is uh, some of what we're doing. I think it make it easier. Okay. All right. We should um, be let's able to add topic. labels yeah. like that just to Kubernetes group path, like SIG. We can you type slash SIG and then the SIG you have. I think we use the same bot, right? So it should it should work. So what does that mean? Like we we if we did like slash SIG scale, it would go right to it would, yeah. Um, uh, pro, I think it's a pro feature, but I'm not sure. I, I only know that in Kubernetes when yeah. there's something like yeah. SIG apps, so you do slash SIG and then apps. Okay, um, um, the pro config, like Kevin said, yeah. How do I do it? Like how, slash SIG scale? Is it no, no, that uh, has to be predefined. Yeah, it has to be predefined. We don't have it right now. And oh, you okay. put a space in between the SIG and the scale, but yeah. Okay. All right, something we can look at next time. Okay. Great. Okay. So then, okay. Second question or second um, point here um, is scale testing. So kind of we'll look at answer the question, like how can we get to thousands of VMs to stress the control plane to test in every PR? Maybe not every PR, but something we can set our, for our goal. Um, daily. Yeah. Daily. Yeah. Daily, whatever, if it's something per release, whatever it is, but we want, we want a ton. We want, we want, I think north of a thousand um, to really, cause stress um so kind of open floor on this like I, like so you already mentioned vms that don't boot um that sounds like that could we, we don't know but it sounds like it could get us somewhere um I, that's to me sounds like an option this is there's a there's another idea that i thought of um because i mentioned q mark originally uh, when we started this six scale and I, I talked to david about this a while ago um and Along a very similar line, this was um, something I had in mind that we could do. I, I wrote a very like one pagey kind of design document around this that's linked there. Um, and it's pretty simple, the idea. Um, all this is, is um, the, or the concept behind this is that because uh, every resource in Kubernetes is a, um, or can be considered a, an API extension, uh, what we could do, um, so we could look at essentially faking um, our components um, so that, that what we could do is we can lie about 
the idea of a, a VM. We basically remove the, the compute aspect out of it. So we have no pods, we have no VMs, we just pass around YAML everywhere. Uh, and we just mock the whole thing. Uh, and yep. so that we have no runtime, we don't have to launch any pods. We could do this with a real API server that controller runtime offers. And we just take tons of YAML and we just throw it at the API and the controller and just see what happens. Um, and this is one idea that I thought could be like a low, a very like something that's achievable that doesn't require a lot of resources to do. Um, I guess you can remove quite some load by implementing in Virt Handle or something like a, a mock client, a mock gRPC client, which sits on the underside of Virt Handler, which does basically nothing except reporting the VM running. And yeah, at the same exactly. time, you can use a very minimal pod that may help a lot already. But yeah, if you remove yeah. more, it may be a little bit trickier to fulfill the pod requests and the VM requests but it's in theory possible too, just for that part. That's interesting. So it's also possible that we could create a code path or a way where we would ignore the pod creation and just immediately <laughs> hand off the vert handler and then uh, pretend like we're doing all the commands. So you can, we, we could use a real cluster and yeah. just tell the QVert control plane to uh, fake the pod creation. Don't actually do it, pretend like it happened. And also, uh, I guess, fake the gRPC calls. Yeah. I don't know. That's yeah. No, I, be, like, uh, I think the, yeah, yeah. no, I, like, the idea would be that we, the idea would be that we, like, when I think, like, when we're looking at what's happening in at this level right here in the middle, um, it's, we're basically, we're moving YAML around, right? And, and so the idea is that it doesn't matter. You know, if these things actually exist, as long as there's YAML, these things are are stressed out. And so, if we can create as much YAML as possible, you know, or what's the way we create as much YAML as possible? We just we just don't have any compute because we don't need any resources. So yeah, we could fake. You could do. We could fake it here. We could fake this whole thing. I mean, um, yeah. And then yeah, those are all ways we could do it. I brought this up internally at Red Hat with uh, some of the OpenShift folks. And the thing that they passed along to me was that it, it gives you something. So Cubemark um, gives them something. But uh, the reality is so much more complex than what Cubemark reveals that it there's so many variables involved that the reality doesn't necessarily match. So we could create something like a uh, kvert and i think that that would give us an idea of something but i'd be careful about trying to say that, that means uh, we it may or may not match reality is the best way to say it i guess what we could yeah. say would be, uh yeah, we the, the main code paths don't have un unintended bugs, I'd say, right? Like you can say, yeah, it's reasonably fast normally. <laughs> yeah, like we could run into, uh, I mean, I, I agree, Dave, like we can run into so many um, issues. Like when we, for instance, like um, uh, like even the, um, like, I mean, lots, lots of different things. But one thing is like I was thinking of is that that recent issue that we had um, and that I posted in the mailing list with the list calls um, from Vert Handler like if we had, if we had, if we were to fake, like we had thousands of vert handlers um, and we had all that YAML floating around, say we had Prometheus enabled, we would have, we would have seen that, that massive spike in latency would have exploded in our faces. And so that's like where we want, we'll see that stuff, but we won't get like, you know, like if we're not running these resources, we're not actually running, we don't have the compute resources running, um, you know, we don't always see like, okay, what's the interaction with um, when you have one handler and there's thousands and thousands of launchers or something, or I don't know what, however many you can fit in a node and things like that and how it holds up with the, the larger cluster. So yeah, we, we can get something, but yeah, we can't, I, I agree, we can't, we can't get everything. And one of those list regressions that we had was actually caused by, it wasn't caused by Prometheus. It was in the Prometheus scraping uh, of our components. So we'd have to, like, that's something that wouldn't necessarily get represented in Kvert either. Prometheus 
hitting our scrape endpoints over and over. Maybe we can make it do that. But. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm using that example because it happened to involve handler. And, if, and like I said, if you enable, if we had enabled it or something, um, then we would have seen it. But like that idea of like, of doing lots of, of lists or something could be hidden in somewhere in here. Like say we're doing a lot of different API calls and we just haven't reached the scale because we don't have the physical capacity to do it. Um, we could find some things. So I guess like the way to characterize is if we if we were to say like create 5,000 fake VMs, it doesn't necessarily mean we can guarantee a scale of 5,000, yeah. but we have at least some confidence that the YAML will hold up um, in our components, we'll have, we won't have uh, massive amounts of latency. In some cases, we will have found some paths where it'll be functional. So it, yeah, it's just another tool. I would say before, like I, we, before we, we go down this route, it probably makes sense to collect some data on the smaller skill sets. Yep. Um, if, I think if we, 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 we are good in integrating the data, I think it's possible with the smaller sets to see tendencies like, okay, with the number, when I start 100 VMs compared to starting 10 VMs, I see that some lists, gets or whatever grow more than they should and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, I, I don't remember if, you know, Kubmar doesn't, doesn't have Kubernetes running in the node. I think what it fakes is the pod creation needs. It's like the container runtime, but the Kubelet is there running. So it, I know it's not the same thing, but I, I kind of considered like the Kube launcher and the Kube handler to be like something like that. It's not, it's the libvirt, uh, sorry, the, lib, uh, the libvirt is our like runtime, isn't it? So then I think instead of, Fake the you know the the kube hand uh, the kube handler and the kube launcher. It's just maybe fake if we need to go for this direction. Okay, if we want, but just fake the lib you know the libvirt uh, itself to create the VM, and and do not exclude you know some uh, key components that kubevirt relies on. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, this I, I think I think what you know you talked about not booting. Like I, I think these are all good options, right. and we we want to see. Let's find what our limits are, and then you know eventually we hit some limits. Uh, it sounds like the the no boot option is the easiest one to start with, so we should start with that. And if we hit mm -hmm. some limits, um, this is something we can consider um, as just a way that we can get mm -hmm. tons of YAML and just see what how our control plane handles it. So that, that's, that is an additional option, something we can, we can keep in mind. Okay. If I think about uh, um, our setup, I think that uh, that setup is quite likely to show up pain points in uh, things like the mutators we have and so on, uh, uh, some of which look potentially single threaded in places and so on. Um, so I think it'll be valuable for that, you know, even beyond the core components. Um, all the additional stuff we're, we're adding and is likely to be added in a, in a production environment. I think it will highlight problems in those quite quickly. Yeah, the other thing I was thinking, um, like we don't, um, like I wonder how many, like Fan did that work, uh, they posted the mailing list, we did like the reconcile changes. Like you wonder like, um, you know, how many different, um, requests we're making, how many API requests we're making to Kubernetes. And that would be interesting to me to see like when we really explode the amount of launchers and our handlers and when we have tons of VMIs, what what ends up happening? You know, like what ha like how costly are these um, requests? So things like that, like we can get we can get some numbers roughly, like that that stuff would still hold like the number of API requests, like we could find that um, this way, and then if something we can know that that's a problem. So th there's some there's a bunch of things that we can I think in here that we can learn. But yeah, so we'll start with uh, to kind of circle back. So I think I think it makes sense. We start with this. I think this is a good way to get things off the ground, and then 
um, as if we hit a limitations is something we can look at expanding to. Okay. All right, just so do folks have any other open topics? This is kind of the two agenda items have for today. Do anything else that people want to bring up? I, ha I have one comment. So in, in Red Hat, uh, we have a meeting, uh, be, uh, you know, be weekly. Uh, it's, all, it's also like a meeting for scaling performance, but it's more for OpenShift. Anyway, so I, some, uh, I, I joined this meeting normally, and I think some guys here also do that. Uh, I don't know if it's possible. So it's be weekly. So if it's maybe, uh, and normally it happens at, you know, uh, the same day as this meeting is happening. Um, I don't know if it's possible if, for you guys for this meeting here, because the other meeting we cannot change. It's a lot of, of people that doesn't want to change. But if it's possible here, uh, just change the, you know, which, which meeting, uh, which week this, this meeting is happening. So instead of like be every two weeks from now, but we maybe, you know, do every two weeks, but in the different, you know, week that it's happening, the other one, like it's starting for next week. And then we, we do like two weeks again. So. If it's possible. Well, what do what do people? Uh, I mean, we we kind of we've had some growing. I mean, we've had a lot of things, but more things are picking up. I mean, right now we're for bi monthly. I don't know. Do people think that it'd be more more or less or the same value if we were to have this weekly? Like we could do that, and then we could get um an every sorry. other schedule. For I'm something. saying bi monthly. Sorry, I I I used the wrong words. So I'm saying bi monthly. It's okay. It's just like uh, the 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 way uh, the yeah. way that it's happening that it's like colliding to another meeting that I have. That's yeah, I understand. I'm monthly as well. So it's what I'm saying is that is a possible solution would be that we could have it. Um, well, maybe, oh, maybe that correct me if I'm wrong, but if we were to go to weekly on Thursday, I would. I was saying is that you'd be able to. It wouldn't conflict every other week, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what I was saying. It's like I I figured I'd just throw that out there. If if people find this meeting valuable and we've been having a lot of content in it. Um, we could look to go to weekly and then, you know, folks that are, have that conflict, you know, you can take the internal meeting and then um, join on the other aspect. But we can have it weekly as long as um, if people find it valuable, then I, if it's, you know, if that's worth the time to have it weekly, I think it makes sense too. But I don't know, what do people think? Is this, um, do you think we'd have enough content with, with things? I mean, we seem to be picking thing, a lot of things up. So maybe. We could go to weekly. I guess at this think? moment, weekly might be good, and later I consider then. And I mean, if and one week the content is less, then you just stop earlier, right? It's not like you have to fill up the hour. Then. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I guess then. So why don't we go to weekly then, and and then it kind of makes it easier anyway for scheduling. Like no one has to remember oh. Or a week and a half out or whatever to the next one so we could just do weekly on thursday and then um yeah then we'll just uh yeah i think that fits better then that'll fit the the schedule that you're that, that conflict okay all right i'll do the i'll do i'll handle logistics with uh the folks and we can get that sorted so we'll do weekly so the next meeting will be next thursday um okay and does anyone have anything else they remember up before we adjourn Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone for your time. I'll see you all online. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan.